No more war. Nie wieder Krieg. Nooit mehr Oorlog. Plus jamais de guerre. Guerra nunca mas. After two world wars, this was a deep desired exclamation. And it sounds like a warning and a pledge. We actually do live in freedom and peace for 76 years now. We organize every year an enormous amount of local and national commemorations to celebrate our peace and freedom. And I was, and still are, part of this institutional network that keeps the remembrance alive to raise awareness of the importance of peace and freedom, especially with younger generations. But is this the way that we can pass on peace and freedom? Reality is that there has been no day without armed conflict since the end of the Second World War. Not conflicts far away, but um, conflicts in which we, the Netherlands, are participating actively, from Korea to Kabul. And we see all kinds of different new types of conflicts, like proxy wars, like in Syria, or hybrid warfare, like in Ukraine, or cyber warfare. So why talking about passing on peace and freedom to future generations if you are not able to establish it today? And how can I, as an individual, make a change, let alone pass on something like peace and freedom? Is peace and freedom not the outcome of large international processes and developments? I grew up in post-war Germany, close to the inner German border, between West and East Germany at the so-called Iron Curtain. My mother was a so-called Vertriebene, an ex a refugee from the part of Poland that was Germany at that time. Every year, she was sending parcels uh, with all kinds of daily goods to some individuals in East Germany and in Poland. And she was helping some individuals in that way. Some of them were victims of concentration camps. But did she make a change? The Germany I grew up in was ashamed of its past. The great country of thinkers and poets derailed from its moral tracks and slipped into national socialism, causing war, depression, and genocide. How on earth could that happen? To find out, I went as part of school assignments to family members, uh, to neighbors, to interview them about the past. I collected pictures, diaries, and address registered life stories. Some did not welcome me, but most were happy to share their story. At the time of Geschichtsbewältigung, the coping with the Nazi history, there was no family I visited that was not talking about the past, often resulting in very emotional conversations trying to explain or at least describe what happened. In fact, passing on these war stories shaped not only my view on history, it shaped my values and my understanding of humankind. And that stresses the importance of talking about history. The dialogue between and within generations is the first step towards passing on peace and freedom. And that is something we all can do. As a teenager, I grew up in the front line of the Cold War two systems entangled in a dangerous arms race, stationing missiles and nuclear weapons, and sucking almost all country of the world into this bipolar power play. A slight accident could have destroyed the world many times, and it almost did. Let's not forget that. Every year, the Allied forces were organizing military exercises in our area. And the Dutch military came often to my village. And let me make a confession. As a small boy, I was trying to do all kinds of sabotage actions, cutting wires and displacing military signs. That was me, yes. <laughs> uh, while I was growing up, and during these tensions of this Cold War, I was asking myself, like all youngsters do, 
what kind of absurd world do I grow up in? What do I want to be? What will be my legacy? What can I achieve? Question, actually, which not only should be asked by adolescents, but also by adults. I first started to deconstruct everything around me, religions, political views, dogmas, rituals, and customs, total destructions of the walls in my mind. I destroyed all the sacred buildings. I became a radical, philosophical anarchist, you might say. It was a devastating battleground in my head. But ultimately, I came to three fundamental insights. First, there is no absolute truth. Second, there is no absolute freedom. And third, there is no absolute meaning to existence. Well, probably that's not the most positive and enlightening outcome, but it was very liberating to me. But with this in mind, how can you pass on peace and freedom? For what, to whom, and why? Like Germany was starting with this Wiederaufbau after the world, the reconstruction after the, uh, of the country, I started to stay from the battleground of my mind. With reason and honesty to myself, I focused on the nature of humans, turning me into a humanist. And I got inspired by natural law, which is a large part also of the basis of the writings of Hugo Grotius. And I never could have imagined in those days, as a teenager in northern Germany, that I would become the director of a castle in the Netherlands, especially not the one where Hugo Grotius was imprisoned, between thick walls to prevent his dangerous idea spreading through the Dutch Young Republic. Considering humans as social and normative creatures that we are, we have to conclude that we need rules and rights, human rights, that we need a social contract between an assigned government and its citizens. We need a just balance between taking and giving, between rights and responsibilities. Morality is the axis of that balance, and consciousness is the ultimate judge. However, our values might also change during circumstances like poverty or war. And it's hard to judge our contemporary situation while we're living in that moment, in that zeitgeist. But history is the only place that teaches us who we are, what we are, and what we are capable of, in good and in bad. And history also puts views into perspective. That takes, makes it so important that we educate our children in history, not figures and numbers, but to understand ourselves. Understanding history can guide and inspire us in present-day challenges, for example, by preventing conflicts and building peace. But also that history is politics and we have to be critical. Don't underestimate the importance of history lessons at school. And as the director of a museum and a World Heritage site, allow me to say, go take your family, your friends, your school classes and colleagues, visit the historical site and a museum. Take a dive into history and get inspired. After graduating from high school, I went instead of military service to Israel for two years of service as part of the Wiedergutmachung, the reconciliation. For me, dealing with German history, that was a logical step. I had a collective guilt feeling because of the war and the horrific Holocaust. Once in Israel, I met many Jews that survived those horrors of the concentration camps. And it's hard to imagine those six millions that didn't survive. When I arrived, that was also the time that the first Intifada started, the uprise of the Palestinians in the occupied territories. My values and beliefs were put to the test. I still deep, feel deep sorrow about the past, but, or better, because I care, I can't look away in this Palestinian-Israeli conflict. 
but rather judging and choosing sides, I try to support both sides in the peace initiatives. Over the last 10 years, I'm supporting a peace initiative in which Palestinians and Jews are living together peacefully, equally, and with mutual respect in one village. At the School for Peace, one institution of this village, we have trained now about 60,000 of change agents, people that are young journalists, politicians, lawyers, uh, artists, engineers, or different kinds of professions, uh, which are key figures in society. Some of them, of these trainees, started peace initiatives themselves again. One day, I attended a meeting at the School for Peace, and about 30 Palestinians and Jews in the midst of their lives were present at this meeting. The subject was the Nakba, that's the Arabic word for catastrophe, and that stands for the permanent displacement of the Palestinians in 1948. During that very emotional meeting that lasted almost all day, all kind of narratives about the past had been dismantled and to better interpret the present and work for the future. That dialogue did not give the final answer to, to everything, nor, no definite truth, nor did it change anything, for instance, for instance, in the unequal power relationship. But there was better understanding, and there was listening to each other. And maybe most important, the other got a human face again. We call that humanification of the enemy. If we start replacing people by abstract stigmas and numbers, we move away from peace and freedom. Be aware, it happens also today. These brief, brave participants uh, of these change agent courses are great examples how to move uh, to pass on peace and freedom. This conflict that never seems to end has taught me one thing, that it is a permanent effort to work for peace, not a final stage. Having said all this, it would be naive and incorrect to only make moral standards on personal level responsible for the peace and freedom in the world. And of course, in society, we need to permanently maintain the moral standards and safeguard our four freedoms of Roosevelt. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of want, from want, and freedom from fear. But on a higher national level, we need international political accountability, democratic control, and a strong legal system. A system Hugo Grotius worked on already 400 years ago a legal system within the state and between the states, international law. If we want to pass on peace and freedom, we continuously have to work for good education, equality, an adequate social and health system, open societies, justice, and functioning institutions on all levels. And everyone contributing to this is actually passing on peace. On international level, we, we experience right now the end of the Pax Americana. To save our European values, we have to be re realistic too. We are shifting away from a single power to a multipolar world, or at least a bipolar world again. A new Cold War between the West and China is not unlikely. In any case, Europe has to strengthen its interna internal cooperation and therefore also its democratic control by the European Parliament. And the United Nations still has a st structure based on the outcome of the World War II and threatens to be obsolete. The rule-based institutional order is at risk and therefore reforms are urgently needed. We have to maintain the balance of power, increase the interdependency between countries and strengthens international law and institutions. We have to build on, on the legacy of Hugo Grotius. It made a deep impression on me when I returned from my service from, it from Israel to Germany and I heard on the news that the border between East and West Germany was open. A peaceful revolution ended the 
separation of the country and culminated in the end of the, second, uh, of the Cold War. I drove all night to get to Berlin and experience the moment of the fall of the wall. What an unforgettable historical moment. Two countries reunited peacefully. Of course, the long and difficult process of unification took and still take, takes decades. But this historical moment was a very inspiring, impressive moment for me. Life is development, and peace is not about preserving the status quo. But this proves that major change is possible in a peaceful way. And this piece of the wall is a permanent reminder for me. Eventually, I went to study development studies at Wageningen University here in the Netherlands, with a focus on law and institutions. By fighting so-called root causes, I hope to contribute to the prevention of future conflicts. I never thought, and perhaps many Dutch might not as well, that a German, I, would organize the commemoration of the end of the Second World War here in the Netherlands. For 13 years, I have fulfilled that position with great commitment and passion. We were trying to raise awareness for the values for peace and freedom, and I believe commemorating and debating the past helps for that purpose. Since two and a half years, I have been working now for the peace and freedom and justice at the Louvestein Castle, a military fortress. I worked there again with a marvelous group of committed people. With exhibitions and educational programs, we confront the visitors with the past to provoke thoughts about the challenges of the, of the future. We are trying to break down walls in our minds for tolerance and peaceful coexistence and we provide education for respect and well-being. My role is modest and, of course, completely paling in comparison with a great figure like Hugo Grotius. And I don't want to suggest that we all can be like him, but it proves that one person can make a change. We all can. And I'm sure some of you will accomplish great things, and I want to encourage you. But what counts at the end is the sum of all our efforts. Thank you very much.